Hi, everybody. My name is Eric. Um, I am also on the platform security team at Google, one of the many platform security teams. Uh, and yeah, today's talk is called uh, Binary Policy with IMA and AppArmor. Um, so I work on the platform security team at Google, a platform security team. The platforms that we are securing are basically all of our corporate devices. So we, you come in, you want to work at Google, we hand you a laptop, we hand you a phone, we hand you a workstation. Maybe not hand you, but you get a workstation. Um, and this, uh, so what the primary motivation of this talk is going to be talking about how we are doing some things to actually do fleet security at Google. Um, we have a lot of devices at Google. Uh, published in 2017, said we had a quarter million machines. Uh, you might imagine that that number has increased in a couple years. Um, and a lot of Linux. So these are workstations, laptops, uh, cloud VMs, uh, servers, you name it, we have it. Uh, and we do our best to try to secure it. Um, one of the interesting aspects of the way that Google operates and operates this fleet of machines is that we also have central app repos for any software we distribute. So you're, when you're working at Google and you have a, a, a Linux device, you're generally not going and downloading from the internet. Hopefully, you're downloading from our central repos where we have built everything um, and sort of have secured that particular aspect of it. So there are a lot of ways that we try to do security for devices. Uh, basically, most of my job is making sure that kernels are up to date and people reboot. Um, but sometimes I get to cool, do some cool stuff. Uh, so this talk is primarily about execution control. Basically, when we get new binaries on the system that want to do malicious things, how can we prevent that? How can we think about that? Um, this is not a new problem or unique to uh, Linux. So. Uh, Google has released uh, Santa, which is a, um, a binary uh, execution control mechanism for uh, Mac OS. And this is just a kernel module that allows us to do allow list type of permissioning and say that this particular um, application can run. Uh, and we can also base things like the signature um, chaining up to particular publishers. Uh, we have sort of similar capabilities for Windows as well. The way you might use this at Google is you might use something like our system that we open source called Upvote. Uh, Upvote is a social allow list uh, mechanism. Uh, the way this works is that you want to run something new on your machine. Uh, in order to actually run it, you have to go to a UI, say vote to whitelist this, and then you can run it. Uh, or in particular cases, you can configure this to say, like, I have to ping a coworker and have them upvote it too. And then eventually, you know, if there gets enough upvotes, you might be globally whitelisted or something like that. Uh, but what about Linux? Uh, so uh, doing this sort of whitelist approach on Linux is kind of convoluted. Uh, the primary use of this is as developer workstations. So you might imagine if you're doing development on a large uh, source tree that you're going to be building new executables all the time. You're going to be running them. And it's basically infeasible for you to be going to a UI and clicking upvote uh, every time you want to run a test or every time you want to build something and just run it. So um, this talk is about an experiment that we are piloting at Google um, internally uh, with AppArmor. Um, so the basic idea is to sign all the things that come from our centralized repo. Then we are going to have some sort of policy uh, around those signatures. So you say that if you're trying to access, if you're a binary and you're trying to access like a Google credential, uh, you should clearly be from our central repository. Otherwise, you wouldn't even know where that Google credential should be. Uh, so this will allow us to do things like block um, uh, access to Google resources from things that aren't Google. Um, you can also, we can also do this to, uh, but a very important aspect of this is we still want to allow you to be able to run unsigned code. So as you're doing your development locally, as you're building executables and running them to do testing, uh, we want that all to still kind of work. I also want to stress uh, the experiment <laughs> aspect of this. Um, we got some of this working, uh, and a lot of this is lies. So don't uh, assume that uh, we have this all working and everything's amazing. Uh, it's janky and hacky all over the place. So uh, the first thing we're going to go through is just talking about IMA and sort of what aspects we use of it and give you little tutorials. So it seems a lot of people are familiar with the subsystem. Um, so IMA has a lot of capabilities. You know, it can interact with TPMs and do boot stuff. But the ones that we really care about are these three properties of auditing, uh, appraising, and protecting. So um, auditing, just logging executables as they run. This is not necessarily related, related to 
this particular experiment, but it's something that we definitely use, um, appraisal of actually when uh, actions occur, verifying signatures, very important, and then protecting is similar to uh, appraise where um, we actually wanna verify other aspects of the binary and other metadata. The way that you interact with IMA, <coughs> excuse me, um, is there's a policy file under SecurityFS. You write a policy to it, uh, fun stuff. Uh, this, will, this policy file will disappear after you write to it, uh, and there are some configurations you can have to like have it stick around so you can read from it or write it again. Um, for the auditing capabilities, um, you can do stuff like set up rules to say, whenever this particular, whenever a new binary runs, uh, audit this to the syslog, or audit D or something. Um, and essentially, you get useful information that can help with your uh, analytics of the fleet. So you might imagine that somebody runs a new binary, it spits out a hash, and you run this against virus total, and say like, okay, is this a known Bitcoin miner that we probably wanna kick off of our system? Um, there's tons of stuff you can do with this particular policy language. Uh, so you can say stuff like don't measure particular types of file systems. Uh, for this one, it's proc. Um, you can also have conditionals like check uh, audit on file checks, but only for write permissions. Uh, you can also do stuff like say, okay, only do it for root. Um, and the one that we actually care about is the subject role one. Uh, this is originally for SE Linux, but totally works for AppArmor 2. Um, it basically says, only execute this particular appraisal or audit or something if the process is gonna be running as a particular profile, as a, uh, in a particular role. So for this case, uh, you could do something like, this would only trigger if the process was running as my app armor profile, a particular profile. Um, and then for appraisal, you actually have to specify this in the policy. So you can say, um, appraise for image signatures, uh, or IMA signatures. Um, we won't talk about hashes today because it's not quite relevant, but that's the default. So in order to say check for a signature, you have to actually add this additional thing to your policy. And then uh, the way it's split up is that you have IMA. Uh, IMA validates the contents of the file and is stored as an extended attribute. So it's security.ima. And then there's EVM. EVM allows us to sign other security extended attributes. So it won't, uh, it's just for uh, like IMA, SE Linux, um, capabilities, those type of things. Uh, you enable it this way, and this is actually gonna be really important when we talk about adding additional metadata to a particular file later on that we might wanna use um, in the future. What that looks like is that when you go ahead and look at a particular binary on a Linux system, uh, for us, you, would, you might see ex additional extended attributes. Uh, secure.evm, secure.ima, these are just gonna be file signature, these are gonna be signatures over either the file contents or the other extended attributes. Um, just a quick slide, um, if you're ever implementing this, it's not just a signature, it's actually a header with the signature. That's really important if you wanna like do this in your centralized repo, um, but otherwise you can just use something like EVM CTL and you're not implementing this yourself, just use the utilities. Distributing signatures has been fun. Um, so we are a derived by stuff of Debian, so we are gonna be using stuff like dpackage and apt. Um, Debian has been thinking about this problem for quite a while, but doesn't have a solution ready to go. So um, there's been a lot of thinking, a lot of identification. Uh, the hacky way that we basically solve this is shipping a .mtree file as part of, part of the deb. Uh, mtrees describe um, file attributes, um, but you can use them to basically say that a particular file would have a bunch of extended attributes. So if you were to go ahead and open a deb of ours, uh, you would see basically an mtree file in the control tar gz. That mg file uh, eventually gets written to varlib dpackage info um, and has a list, a list of files in the deb and then additional signatures that we've added from our centralized repo. So this has extended attribute, security, IMA. If you went further on to the left, uh, you would see EVM and uh, security.appArmor as well. Um, this is one of the hacky aspects of this solution. Uh, so the way that we actually get the, the signatures onto disk is we just have a dpackage hook. 
dpackage allows you to have hooks that just sort of like execute whenever dpackage, before or after dpackage. Um, and then we just have a little hook. It's written in Go, um, and it steps through any of the mtree files in the dpackage info directory, and we'll go ahead and apply those extended attributes to the files. Um, this is really hacky. It has really bad implications because like postint and uh, preint don't have the extended attributes when they run. Um, we would much prefer this to be actually in dpackage, but um, our initial sort of work to, done, to do that uh, hasn't been merged yet, and we'll see if when that happens. Uh, key rings are another fun part of dealing with IMA. Uh, there was a great talk about key ring restrictions. Um, so the TLDR is that IMA can either use compiled in key rings uh, for the .ima or .evm, but we choose to use uh, user managed key rings underscore IMA underscore EVM. That's how you would sort of set this up. That's more for notes than anything, but essentially you just go ahead and create this in like the init ramfs and load your keys. Um, so what about reboots? So eventually we would like to do sort of, sort of rotation of these keys. We don't just wanna have the same signing key and continue on forever. Um, unfortunately, users don't like to reboot. Uh, we do our best to enforce this, but ultimately we don't wanna have to wait like 30 days or something like that to, for the potentially loading new keys. Um, so you, we use keyring restrictions, yay. Thank you to, yes. <laughs> um, so keyring restrictions work by you have a key ring, but then you have another key ring that restricts the key ring. This one is gonna be the CA key ring. When you try to add something to the actual key ring, um, you can basically create a restriction to say, um, does this certificate, uh, is this certificate signed by another key ring? And that allows us to do um, online updates of the key rings that IMA and EVM use without um, requiring a reboot. And this is sort of how you would set it up. So finally, we get on to using all of this information that we've just set up in a very meticulous way. So um, I've been working with the AppArmor project uh, and Matthew Garrett as well to add um, support for AppArmor targeting uh, extended attributes. And we've sort of done a bit of the work to do add the user land support as well. So the basic idea that we'd like to do is have two tiers of profiles. One we'll call untrusted, things without signatures, and another one called trusted, things with signatures. So what's nice about these particular profiles is that the bottom one will say anything that has a security.evm or security.ima um, extended attribute, that's gonna match this profile, and it will attempt to run as trusted. Then we can set up an ima profile, uh, sorry, an, an ima policy to say that if something has run as trusted, then we trigger appraisal. So this is nice because things without signatures just completely avoid this block, but anything that attempts to run in this trusted profile, something that maybe could access Google credentials, is now going to be appraised. So these must match in order for it to execute. Um, a really cute trick here is actually the differences in these transactions. Um, so untrusted, I believe, is like inherited uh, transactions. Um, but essentially what this does is untrusted is only allowed to transition to untrusted. Trusted is allowed to transition to anything. Why this is really important is because if you think about all the binaries that we ship, everything is signed, right? Curl is signed, uh, cat is signed, whatever. So what those sort of cute transition do is create a trust trapdoor. So the way it will work is that things with signatures will run in trusted. But as soon as anything in the process uh, tree is untrusted, it can't get out of untrusted. It can no longer be trusted. So we get to this point where you might have curl, but it depends on how you got there that is actually important. So if anything in your chain wasn't signed, then you cannot access a Google resource, as an example. Scripts suck for this. Um, <laughs> so, you know, a really easy way that you might get around this is just running an interpreter that we've signed. Um, one of the most remarkable things is AppArmor actually handles shebangs correctly, that when you uh, execute a script with a shebang, AppArmor will appraise either, if you just execute the script, um, it will appraise and say, this is a script, uh, or it will 
it will care about the script. If you use the interpreter directly, it'll use the interpreter. It'll um, match the interpreter. And shared libraries are just fun and hard to deal with. So this is our sort of idea of how we um, deal with this. So remember that we added additional information to this curio app armor field. Um, this will hold like the binary name, and we can actually do matching against this. Because we have secure.evm, we know that all of these are tamper-proof, that you would need to actually have signed the binary to fill in this data. And if you remove secure.evm, you won't uh, match the trusted profile. So this allows us to carve out special cases where you might want to say, okay, uh, Python isn't trusted. If you run the script, you'll be fine directly with a shebang. You can sign that. But if you just go ahead and execute the interpreter directly, you're actually going to be in the same tier as untrusted, and you'll only be able to transition to other untrusted um, contexts. Um, there are fun <laughs> caveats with App Armor currently. Um, support for IMAT and EVM has a small bug in it, so we can't actually target it. Um, this is getting fixed. Um, no new privs has bit us a couple times. We had fun times where we crashed a bunch of machines because um, the way that App Armor deals with no new privs is it makes conservative guess about when you when you execute no new privs, App Armor does not want to allow you to transition to a profile with more uh, with more capabilities. That seems reasonable, but. It's actually hard for App Armor to reason if you give it two profiles about which one has more or less power. So conservatively, it just denies it. Um, this actually has caused us some issues where um, something that is trusted is attempting to transition to untrusted. And even though that should be fine, because it's executed no new privs, that fails. Uh, system, we have had, had a lot of fun with systemd. Um, and then there's some fun stuff around script modules again and uh, bash uh, remains a pain point. Um, this solution doesn't solve people curling stuff into pipe bash, um, but we hope to have other sort of controls separate from it. Um, additional future work that we've been interested in is SecMock. So this is a kernel capability that we believe sort of works, um, and we're working to add the user land support, but this is like way in the future. Um, and basically, it works in the same way that SE Linux would work. You can label particular packets and associate them with a security context. So the way you might imagine this is we might write an IP table rules um, for, the, for the dash A input. We would say, like, OK, that says for internal Google services. And then uh, tie them to a particular, through a network label to a particular profile. So you'd have to have a, be running as a particular profile to access certain aspects of the network. Rollout has actually been probably the most interesting part of all of this. Um, so remember, we have like quarter million machines uh, and a lot of fun. This is the first little bit of rollout fun that we had. Uh, so this is a log event that comes out of App Armor. Um, it's pretty reasonable, right? You can read this. SSH was attempting to access a private key. Uh, the operation was open, and it failed because it's running as untrusted. But if you remember, um, we were setting this up in such a way that it actually is not only about the final binary that's running, it's about the entire process tree. The entire process tree has to be trusted in order for the final one to be. But both of these operations at the end are exactly identical. So SSH for both of these process trees are accessing it. But for the top one, it's totally fine. For the bottom one, that was uh, that's when the violation was generated, and we would get that audit event. So the next question is, like, how did this become untrusted? And this context doesn't give us enough information. So there's no process tree information, no extended attribute information, um, and com sucks. Uh, so <laughs> for anyone who's tried to do this, you learn very quickly, uh, com is the thread name, uh, which random binaries can set to whatever. We had a fun case where a single shared library was being loaded into everything, setting the com name, and then like all of our violations were for this one shared library. Or it's a truncated path. <laughs> um, so I think it's limited to like 16 characters. If you have a long path, you're really out of luck. Um, and it doesn't work with shebangs. If you execute a script or execute in the interpreter, you get the same com uh, value. And this is the same with proc too, uh, which is also a pain. Uh, what we had to do is actually build a really fun logs pipeline. 
Um, so basically, in order to get useful information out of our fleet about why this strategy was working or wasn't working, we had to collect processed information from all of the hosts. Um, we already do this because of, you know, um, sort of signals reasons anyway, so it was convenient for us. If you're doing this, it might not be convenient to log every process execution through Oddity. Um, and then we had to go ahead and write some programs to attempt to recreate the process tree on the back end and then figure out what the process tree looked like and why we were hitting a particular failure for a portion of a quarter million machines. Um, this is where it's really nice to be Google because we can do this and we have all the, have all the tooling. Um, but I have burned through so, many, so much CPU and so much memory just trying to get reasonable information sort of out of our fleet because we depend on this process tree. But we did end up getting results. Um, what about the results? Uh, process trees are really messy. Uh, the difference between saying that I care about every process in the process tree and caring just about the final executing binary turned out to be an order of magnitude difference in noise and random stuff that we caught. Um, it turns out users like building stuff <laughs> and running it. Um, we had scenarios where people were building IDEs or building uh, like Tmux locally, and suddenly everything was becoming untrusted. Uh, and shockingly, you might imagine that some people are running binaries that didn't come from our central repo. Um, everything is a package manager these days. Um, you don't need sudo to install new packages either. Uh, so people you know, build get things, they use git clone, they run docker, docker. Um, so the result is that this is messy. <laughs> this is extremely messy. And in terms of where from here, um, I think that we will continue to leverage AppArmor in some serious way because we need access control. Whether or not we will continue to use this sort of process tree type strategy will sort of determine on our ability to go through and say, can we fix this systematically? Or is there just gonna be way too much noise if we turn this on in an enforcing capacity? So it's kind of interesting to see. Maybe I'll come back next year and tell you everything is fixed. Um, but it's been an interesting experiment. And uh, now if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. Thanks, James. Uh, I'm curious about the App Armor sort of approach because you're, you're trying to build a security domain transition system using a model that is not a security domain transition system when a security domain transition system exists already in the kernel and is pretty well established and used. So one of the really nice benefits of App Armor is that we get basically all of Debian support for ex the existing stuff. So as we turn on App Armor, we actually get security benefits just from the fact that we are sort of a derivative of Debian. This was the main motivator around supportability of any sort of Linux security module that we're using because we're just like at such a big scale. Um, and Matthew Garrett, it looks like you're itching to have a comment too. <laughs> yeah, so one of the problems with doing this with an SE Linux-based approach is that right now we do the package signatures, including the EVM signature, on the build system. And as a result, we can't apply labeling on the client. So if we were using SE Linux, we would need the build system to be aware of the policy, and then any modifications of the policy would mean we'd need to relabel the files in the build system, resign those, and right now, that would mean taking every existing binary package and having a mechanism for pushing it through there again every time we have a policy update that involves even one file in the system requiring a different label. So otherwise we can't have the EVM protection and we need the EVM protection in order to protect against offline attacks. Sure, right, so we'd only need to, we would only need to do this for each package, but then we do need it conflate, It brings something that is effectively local policy into the build system, and that's a conflation that doesn't work particularly well for how we build stuff at the moment. Yeah. So that was one of the motivations for just having the entire policy be client-side based. And ultimately, too, like, I think that the difference, for us at least, is like 
the issues we're hitting is not necessarily with AppArmor, it's just what our users expect to. And I think the, the main sort of risk for this is that our expectations about what users should be doing and what they are and are used to is dramatically off. And that would be true regardless of whatever sort of Linux security module we were, did, we did go with. So, so one thought is, have you thought about using like upvote type thing to allow the developer to say, look, that it gives a prompt and you, you then have a level in between trusted and not trusted, like say developer okayed this. Because people, developers tend to want to say, yeah, I am in control of my system. And yeah. I am sure I could get promo if I rolled out upvote to Linux. Um, whether or not that would cause too many people to quit is a question. Um, it, it's... You have like a paperclip coming out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think like, you know, sort of our thought around users who wouldn't have to run a lot of binaries and therefore wouldn't be interacting with upvote very much is often like, please just go use Chrome OS or go use Windows. Um, because those are environments that are much more locked down than sort of the development environment. So there's a lot of things we're thinking about and a lot of potential solutions, but um, that's one that has been yeah. hard to sell. Because it's probably not a good solution for developers who build their own code. Yeah. Except to, for them to acknowledge somehow that they built it. That, I yeah. solemnly swear. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but you could, we've, we've thought of stuff like maybe allowing a security key to store something that could sign it, so you'd like have a touch. Um, that might be doable, but then, you know, if you have a large chain of executables <laughs> touching that like 500 times when people already have to touch the security key quite a bit at Google is, again, maybe comes down to palat palatability. Any other one? Does this work for like LinkedIn libraries? So like dynamically LinkedIn libraries? Or the so, binary is just tr trusted to... So I believe I'm a, um, appraisal is transitive, like as you memory map things in, that this will be, those will also go through appraisal. Um, it, it is harder for things like a Python module, right? So um, if it's just referencing and reading stuff from disk, then that is not transitive. Does the system for trusting things, particularly uh, with interpreters, where you might have like a signed, you know, Google Python script that is trusted, mean that uh, sort of they are all required to basically enforce things like I don't load sort of remote code execution YAML or pickles or like anything like that would totally sort of blow up the system? Is that right? Um, you found a hole in my plan. No, yeah, I mean, it, that's a clear problem. Um, Yes. <laughs> I, there's no, there doesn't really exist good answers around this, particularly when we're still supporting sort of old Debian packages too that might not depend on the latest Python with the latest uh, security hooks as we saw a few days ago. So yeah. We're just gonna put everything in containers and it'll be much better. Uh, Did you guys uh, consider working with the distro vendors uh, to sign the binaries inside the packages? Um, we haven't. Um, we haven't engaged with like Debian to do that. We build everything ourselves, um, so we would we are in a position to sign it anyway. Um, so we still receive and validate all the binaries, all the signatures that come from Debian. But um, ultimately, we are in control of the way that these devs are built and signed ourselves. So we can just inject signatures when we want to. I see. So you, uh, uh, you IME sign the binaries and you repackage the, uh, the original package? Uh, yeah. So we actually pick this apart, um, create this M tree file, and then in our build system, and then sign everything ourselves. I see. OK. Matthew, Matthew you has apparently it. have another comment. So yeah, ideal goal would be for distributions to do this, and then we 
as far as possible, we want all of this to be ecosystem available rather than just being something linked in with us. At the moment, um, as Eric mentioned, we're driving stuff from Debian. One of the interesting features of Debian is that when a package is uploaded, you don't just upload the source. The maintainer has to upload a binary built for at least one architecture, and then that package is incorporated directly into the distribution. So right now, with Debian's infrastructure, you would need to re-architect how package uploads are handled, or every Debian developer would need to be able to sign every Debian package, which would probably not be the most desirable outcome. reason for this is if you don't um, sign software at the origin, then you lose the sense of the origin or the identity, actually. So if you re-sign it yourself, so that's your primary motive. Yeah. 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 We, we've been looking at um, using uh, SWID tag, extensions to SWID tags to provide signatures. You didn't mention that. Is there any notion? I mentioned in my presentation we're doing that for firmware, and that's a focus, but the next step would be working with David Safford and others to um, extend SWID tags to include IMA signatures and measurements. Have you thought about that? Um, so I'm not sure what that gets you in our setup. Um, I mean, obviously, it would be incredibly beneficial for more people to generate IMA and EVM, or IMA signatures for their binaries, but the yeah, yeah. Um, my job so far has been focusing on getting this all to like function in a reasonable capacity. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I mean, just in terms of like binary provenance, um, that is a huge problem uh, that is way beyond the scope of what we're trying to address here, but is definitely something that smarter people than I are thinking about at Google at least. Yeah, so the uh, Debian spec that you talked about for dpackage, I keep an eye on that every, every so often. I've noticed that it's kind of become stale. It hasn't been updated in about two years. But I believe that I heard that uh, dpackage, you guys have a merge request against dpackage to add file signatures. Is that Ma right? Matthew, is that you again? <laughs> it, <laughs> all right. Yeah, I just didn't see it in the, uh, in the spec, so I, I, I want to take a look at it. Thanks for uh, coming to the last talk of the day. Thanks, Eric. <laughs>